a handsome teenager with the whole world at his feet. The all-American boy, great smile, good-looking kid. Accused of an awful crime. And he had said, you know, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Protected by parents who thought their son could do no wrong. Alex was one brave kid to do what he did. He ran from justice and hid out in style. It's a big world out there. There's lots of places to go. Can a wealthy family keep their fugitive son out of the grasp of the law? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. On the wrestling mat, Alex Kelly was king. At 18 years old, he was strong, fierce, and unbeatable. With a record of 11 and 0, Kelly was heading toward a county championship. The teenager had it all, looks, charisma, wealth, and popularity. It seemed like he could get away with anything. On the morning of February 14th, 1986, two Darien police officers stopped Kelly on his way to his most important wrestling meet and arrested him for rape. Kelly wasn't concerned. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. But the star wrestler was worried about one thing. The only question he had for them was, am I gonna get out of here in time to go to my wrestling match? Alex Kelly had been raised to think he could get whatever he wanted, whether it was a victory on a wrestling mat or a girl's embrace. It would take eight years and an international manhunt before he learned that there are limits even to privilege. The police in Darien were getting familiar with Kelly. Two days earlier, he had been accused, though not charged, with another rape. I think he went through you know, the majority of, his, at least his adolescence, as a person who never really had to, you know, be called to task for anything that he did. Darien police began to realize that Kelly had the potential for violence. The star high school athlete had been raping girls and getting away with it for years. The case set off an eight-year manhunt and a scandal that rocked one of America's wealthiest communities. It also raised a disturbing question. How could a golden boy become a serial rapist? And how could a whole town not have noticed? Darien, Connecticut is one of America's wealthiest suburbs. It's a picturesque genteel place with private streets and million dollar homes. Children here grow up sailing on Long Island Sound and driving BMWs. It was not unusual there at 16th birthday to see a bright shiny new car in the parking lot, usually parked across two parking spaces. <laughs> so that the, the student parking lot had automobiles that far outshone those of the faculty. There was a great emphasis on surface serenity, surface order. And I think uh, that, that sort of gave the town a history of learning how to conceal things. In the 1980s, Darien appeared serene. But when the town's parents went on vacation, its teenagers ran wild. I could be walking down the hall and you might see a piece of paper and you pick it up and it would say, house party tonight, parents away, such and such address, bring booze or whatever. There were houses that were literally trashed. The parties got out of hand. As a teen, Hillary Tolet from neighboring Stamford, Connecticut went to these parties. But usually there was lots of beer. Um, no parents home, ever, <laughs> from what I remember. Uh, somebody had most likely pilfered a bottle from one of their parents' liquor cabinets. Parents in Darien expected the police to enforce the law, but not too much. They like to know that you're gonna come if you call them, but they certainly don't wanna have to come pick their children up from the police department. 
Alex Kelly's parents, Joe and Melanie, had raised three boys in Darien. Melanie came from a wealthy family, but Joe Kelly was different. Joe Kelly was a plumber who grew up in a, in a very uh, low economic se section of, of Stanford and rose to uh, above his station, so to speak. Joe wanted even more for his children. He dreamed that Alex would go to Harvard on a wrestling scholarship. He had everything going for him. He was a, a nice looking kid. He had uh, athletic, very athletic. Um, he seemed to be popular in, in his school. Meanwhile, there were rumors that behind the doors of the Kelly house, Alex's life was not as charmed as it seemed. Some of the friends that I spoke to saw Alex Kelly being uh, f physically punished by his father and, and very scared of it. On the football field, Kelly was wild, fast, and tough. His wrestling coach said that when he had an opponent pinned, there was just always a moment where he could almost see this, I'm going to go after this. The coach always felt that there was just a little extra edge there that he had that some others did not. It was a jock culture. Athletics was the most important thing, and that kind of excelling mattered the most. The same desire to push boundaries showed up in the way Kelly partied. He drank more, did more drugs, and made more mischief than the rest of his crowd. He was out of control, and his aggression was not just limited to parties and sports. It was not unusual for Alex and his particular girlfriend at the time to have a fight, and it became a visible fight with the, the whole audience, the cafeteria is the audience, with screaming match and so on. Stories began to circulate that Kelly had forced girls to have sex with him. There was such a informal grapevine on him that um, one of the young women who uh, had a near attack by him said, we had a name, we had a nickname for him, Alex Kelly MR, as in Marcus Welby MD, Alex Kelly Mad Rapist. And this was in high school, so the girls knew. There must have been plenty of people in Darien who saw that Alex Kelly was a little too violent on the field, too reckless with his friends, too aggressive with girls. But no one said anything until it was too late. Alex Kelly entered Darien High School as a 14-year-old football prodigy, known for his fierceness on the field. He was the kind of star athlete that most teen girls would want to date. But it was rumored that Kelly's intensity could explode off the field as well. And according to some of his classmates, the freshman was smoking pot and doing cocaine. A rich kid out of control, indulged by his parents, and made popular by his peers. But Alex Kelly was about to cross the line that divides the simply reckless from the criminal. Kelly and his friends couldn't ask their parents to pay for the drugs. And by his sophomore year, they started breaking into the homes of their wealthy neighbors. That was like a network that kind of found out who was going to be away from home and they would get in and get the silver and, and so on and be gone very quickly and get into the city very quickly and get rid of it. Kelly and his friends stole an estimated $100,000 in valuables over a six month period. But it didn't take long for the Darien police to trace the robberies back to him. He was arrested with some of his friends, his girlfriend and a couple other kids, and they were put through the criminal justice system and he ended up going to jail. Alex's parents hired a lawyer, uh, you know, tried to sort of, I won't say beat the system, but play the system. The Kellys struck a deal. They would reimburse their neighbors for the stolen goods if Alex received a reduced sentence. There's a clear history with Alex of his parents fixing things of them, you know, ignoring behaviors, of them, um, you know, pushing it off, of them pretending it didn't happen, of them, um, 
you know, sweeping it under the rug. Even though someone like Joe Kelly would put down the other, the corporate families for coddling their kids and spoiling their kids, uh, the, the, the tack he took with his son when Alex started uh, showing real problems was the same kind of thing. Joe and Melanie kept their son out of jail long enough for him to enjoy his summer. But in September of 1984, instead of returning to Darien High School for junior year, Kelly was sent to a juvenile detention center. He stayed just two months before his parents persuaded the judge to transfer him to a drug rehabilitation facility. Well, to this day, they will still tell you if you ask them about Alex's burglary issue, um, they will tell you that he was put in drug rehab. When Kelly returned to Darien High School the following fall, he began dating Amy Molitor. Amy was the kind of girl that Darien boys called a Muffy, a blonde preppy good girl. Alex and Amy were soon inseparable, and Amy seemed to quiet Kelly's demons. In his senior year, he made the honor roll and had his best wrestling season yet, finishing the year undefeated. Many felt Kelly's troubles were behind him. He came back and convinced people that he was, you know, he had changed, that he wasn't doing that anymore. He had that wonderful smile. He had a sincerity that you believed. There was no reason not to believe him. Yet we know now that he absolutely was. He was drinking, he was doing drugs, he was, you know, right back on the same path he had been on before. And apparently what he learned was he could put on this appearance and fool everybody. In the winter of his senior year, Kelly gave a Darien girl a ride home one night after a party. According to the girl, they were halfway to her house when Kelly pulled over into a secluded spot, forced her into the back seat, and raped her. The 15-year-old girl didn't report what had happened to her, but she did tell her friends at school. Nobody believed her. She told his girlfriend. The girlfriend said, oh, how could you go after my guy? You know, they had kind of like a cat fight about it in high school. And uh, she told me Alex would brush up against her in the hall and call her a slut. So, I mean, I think he, yes, on a deep level, probably did think he could get away with it. Darien's girls knew Alex Kelly was dangerous, but to his parents and teachers, he still seemed like a success story. A local paper even published an article praising Kelly. The article called Alex Kelly a model student athlete. It was probably not the most accurate way to describe a teenager who was taking drugs and ambushing girls. This would be the last time ever anything good would be written about Alex Kelly. Winter break was coming up. Alex's girlfriend, Amy Molitor, was taking a vacation with her family. He was staying behind in Darien. So Amy let him borrow her Jeep Wagoneer while she was away. But Alex didn't need Amy's car. He needed Amy. Amy was his safety net, and she was gone. I was chaperoning a uh, ice hockey game and standing on the first bleacher, and Alex came in and stood beside me. And I remember when he left me, I thought, gee, I wonder how he's going to get along for a whole week without a girlfriend. Alex had convinced just about everyone in Darien that he was a good kid who had learned his lesson. He's reformed. Little did they know, he was about to commit a truly evil act. On February 10th, 1986, Kelly and a dozen other Darien teenagers were having a party at a friend's house. Late in the evening, a pretty sophomore named Adrienne Back began asking around for a ride. She needed to get home in time for her 11.30 curfew. Kelly offered to drive her, and Adrienne reluctantly accepted. She had heard of his reputation, and she was not real comfortable with the idea of him driving her home. But, she, you know, the other side of that is your dad's going to be mad, and you're probably going to have some consequence there for breaking your curfew. Alex and Adrian left the party. Within a few minutes, they were on Adrian's street. Kelly drove past her house and parked. 
Then, the star wrestler grabbed Adrian by the throat and pinned her to the seat. It's violent, and she's scared. I mean, she, you know, she related to us that at that point in time, she really believed that if she didn't go along with him, he would kill her. Alex forced Adrian into the back of the car. She started to scream until Alex grew more violent. Then he ripped her clothes off, threw, threw her in the back. This is somebody who'd never had sex before. She was, it was all very stunning to her. Alex threatened a sobbing Adrian, warning that if she told anyone about the rape, he would kill her. Then he drove her down the block to her house. After several hours, Adrian's father, Bill Back, coaxed his daughter into telling him what had happened. Outraged, he telephoned Joe Kelly. Joe didn't believe that his son had done it, but he woke Alex up and repeated the accusation. Alex was unfazed. He told his father, we had sex, Dad, now go back to bed. And Joe Kelly did. The next day, Adrian reluctantly went with her family to report the rape to the Darien police. She probably was one of the most emotionally devastated crime victims I have ever dealt with at that point. Adrian's parents felt she was too emotionally fragile to press charges. The family had been set to go on a skiing vacation and Mrs. Back told the police they would think about what to do while they were away. The police decided not to contact Alex Kelly or his parents. The feeling in the department was, we're not gonna go forward with this if we can't get him. You know, we're not gonna go and then have him laughing at us saying, hi, you couldn't make your case, because he was the kind that he would do that. Two days later, on February 13th, Kelly went to another party. 17-year-old Hillary Tolette was there, too. I, I remember him doing tequila shots at the kitchen island and standing there and, and striking up a conversation. Later on, Hillary was smoking outside, and she asked if she could finish her cigarette in Kelly's truck. As soon as she climbed in, Kelly drove off. I said, I'm fine, I don't need a ride home. You know, you can just stop the car and I'll get out. And so he continued to go faster. I asked him, you know, what, wh where are you going and what are you doing? And um, it seemed to me he knew exactly where he was going. He took her to the parking lot of an exclusive country club down the road from where the Kellys lived. He stopped the car and was making advances and leaning over and trying to kiss me and I was at this point fairly scared because of the what had happened up to this point was seemed to be completely out of my control so not figuring out that, that it, I don't think it was going to get any better um, forced forced me to kiss him and then proceeded to get me in the back of the blazer and and uh, rape and sodomize me when it was all over Alex drove Hillary back to the party. He had said, you know, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. And... But when she got out of the truck, Hillary ran straight up to a friend's car and told her what Kelly had done. I just felt this surge of anger about what had happened. And as I was describing it to her, I realized that this wasn't going to be the last time I, exp I said it. I got into work at 7 o'clock in the morning, and the first thing they said to me is, get in your uniform and get upstairs. You have to photograph injuries. We had another sexual assault. And I jokingly said, don't tell me. And they said, they just nodded their heads. And I, you know, I was just dumbfounded. I couldn't believe he had the nerve to do it again. But he did. The police laid out a lineup of photos so that Hillary could identify her attacker. As soon as they put Alex Kelly's picture down, I, I pointed at it, and, and I felt a kind of a knowing glances going on around behind me. Even though she was shaken, Hillary pressed charges. For the first time, someone had stepped forward to point a finger at Alex Kelly. Life was about to change for Darien's golden boy. 
On February 14, 1986, Kelly was taken into custody on his way to a wrestling meet. He recalls the scene in this 1997 interview. I was driving to school, the lights come on, and the next thing I know, it's like the movies. You know, put your hands on your head and the whole deal. I, I had no idea what was going on. He was in jail, but Kelly insisted that he was innocent. The sex, he said, had been consensual. I had no idea that this could happen just on some allegation, just on somebody's word, that somebody can be accused and just your whole life can be just torn apart just on somebody saying something. Kelly's parents didn't believe he'd done anything wrong either. They hired high-priced local defense attorney Mickey Sherman, who had won acquittals for other clients accused of sexual assault. He obviously said that he never engaged in any non-consensual sex, and he stuck to that from day one. This was unbelievable that somebody, I mean, it just, it's not real. Why would I, why would I rape somebody? When Adrian Back heard that Hillary had pressed charges, she decided to do the same. Now, Kelly stood accused of two rapes. His parents posted a $200,000 bail so that Alex wouldn't have to remain in jail. I didn't hesitate for a minute. Because he's my son. He was given a police monitored curfew. He told friends that the rape charges would be easy to beat. He spent the summer partying, staying out late, and taunting Darianne's cops. He violated curfew continually. We were continually getting calls that he's at a party here, he's doing this, he's out, you know, at 11, 12, 1 o'clock at night. Kelly and his family resented the police attempts to enforce his curfew. They complained it was harassment. The victim's families were very uh, uh, much upset when they would see him on the street and not wanting to exacerbate the situation. Alex said, you know, why don't I just go out to Colorado and work out there? Kelly's attorney, Mickey Sherman, petitioned the court to let him get out of Darien and await his trial in a town near Aspen where his family went on ski vacations. The Darien police had already let Alex slip through their fingers once and then he turned around and raped again. They couldn't keep track of him, even when he was under their nose. And now the prosecutor agrees to let Alex go to Colorado. I mean, it's just incredible. In his eight months in Colorado, Kelly skied, mountain climbed, and worked a part-time job while he waited for his trial to begin. Back in Connecticut, Prosecutor Bruce Hudock petitioned the court to try both rape charges together, saying it would save the state time and money. Mickey Sherman, worried that a jury would be swayed by a double-barreled prosecution, argued that it would violate Kelly's rights. You know, if a jury is going to hear two people say it rather than one person, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty damning. But the court ruled to hear the two cases at the same time. Mickey Sherman flew to Colorado to meet the Kellys and advise his client. I told him in moment one that that was just, just was not right. It wasn't fair. I thought he was getting screwed. Uh, and I thought he was not getting a fair trial. The trial was set to begin on Monday, February 16, 1987. As the date got closer, Kelly grew more frightened. Monday comes and court time comes and Joe and Melanie are in court. Mickey Sherman's in court to represent Alex and no Alex. Genteel town, arrogant boy, wealthy parents. The press was all over this story. Opening day, the courthouse was packed. Everybody showed up but Alex Kelly. The judge is asking where Alex is. I told him that I had a recent conversation that he was very apprehensive, and I assumed that that's why he's not there. As soon as I heard that they couldn't find him anywhere, I knew it was, that was it. He's gone. I didn't think, you know, I lost him in the bathroom. I figured he's, he's on his way somewhere way far away. Alex's parents had spoken to him last, but the Kellys claimed they had no idea where their son was. The police didn't buy it. He's telling friends in Colorado his mother had given him $10,000. Ultimately, we came to believe that he fled the country. Everything was stacking up. Things were perpetuating, just one thing after another. So I was terrified. I was scared. I ran. At first, 
Alex zigzagged across Europe, afraid of getting caught. But he didn't have anything to worry about. Whoever was giving him his travel money was clearly prepared to outspend the small Darien police force. We had never had anybody disappear like this, um, you know, with the potential that they left the country, that, you know, that they were being well-funded. Weeks and then months passed. No one could find Alex Kelly. Interpol and the FBI joined the hunt, but he eluded them all. It's a big world out there. There's lots of places to go. Kelly found he could navigate freely around Europe on a permanent vacation, hitting the best ski slopes. And just as he had in high school, he found a pretty blonde girlfriend, a Swedish girl named Elizabeth Janssen. Kelly evaded capture time and again, even when he ran into people who recognized him. I bumped into people and they'd say, you're Alex Kelly. I'd say, nay, you're not Alex Kelly, you're coming from Sverige. <laughs> you know, I would speak another language or something. I would try my best to get out of there, or else I'd say, no, I don't understand, and walk away. He lived in France in the winter and skied and ice climbed and rock climbed and parasailed. He lived in Sweden in the summer on an, a beautiful little coastal island. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I certainly would like to take that kind of vacation at some point. And while Alex Kelly was living the high life in Europe, his victims were forced to accept that he might have gotten away with it. In order to go on with my life and have it halfway normal, I had to kind of let it go a little bit. Hillary moved out west, trying to put the rape behind her. But every few months, she would get a call from the Darien police updating her about the case. After a while, you just stop believing and sightings of Alex Kelly. It just was, well, when you find him, let me know, and I'll be here. The Darien community rallied around the Kellys, the couple who had seemingly lost their son. I certainly felt very sorry for his family because I felt that they didn't know any more about him, where he was, than anyone else. But the Kellys knew exactly where Alex was. Joe and Melanie Kelly were financing Alex's life underground. They sent him money regularly and even met him in Europe for secret ski vacations. Kelly was hardly living the life of a fugitive. He even appeared in a friend's film about ski bums, blithely using his own name. Doesn't everybody have to have some sort of activity, some sort of life? I wasn't going to just sit in a box somewhere. The fact that nobody found him was preposterous. He, you know, he was living the high life. But Alex Kelly's luck was about to run out. In 1991, the FBI put a new man on the case, Special Agent Ralph DeFonzo. He had a hunch that Kelly's parents were bankrolling their son's fugitive life. Well, I think anytime somebody has money, they're going to be a little harder to find. In the case of Alex Kelly, it seemed like he fell off the face of the earth. DeFonzo was an expert in hunting down fugitives, and he was determined to succeed where everyone else had failed. Oh, uh, Agent DeFonzo from the FBI, uh, he, he was very diligent, and very aggressive. Early in the morning on July 18, 1994, he led a raid on the Kellys' house. And now that's something I've never used in a fugitive investigation, is serving a warrant to find items like we were looking for, letters and passports and monies and this kind of stuff. Usually you're, you serve a warrant to get in somebody's house to look for a body. As the agents walked in, they immediately found evidence that the Kellys knew where Alex was hiding. A letter in Melanie's handbag addressed to their son's girlfriend in Sweden. DeFonzo finally had the link that could lead him to Alex Kelly. I felt that looking at the envelope and the address, that boy, that was, a, that was the uh, only piece of information we had in 10 years that looked really good to me. And I just walked out of the house and went to the Darien Police Department and started making phone calls. Swedish agents went to the address on the letter but Kelly was one step ahead of them. Melanie Kelly had already called her son to tip him off, and he immediately fled to Switzerland, 
where extradition laws would prohibit the U.S. from prosecuting him for jumping bail. On January 19, 1995, after a negotiated agreement, Alex Kelly surrendered in Zurich. He was returned to the U.S. on May 4th, eight years after he had first fled the country as a teenager. The 27-year-old was greeted by the international media. Alex gave himself up, but he considered himself innocent. And with his parents' money behind him, he was about to try and beat the rap. When I learned what he had been doing, you know, that having a good time in resorts, just a sense of great disbelief and almost disgust. Joe and Melanie Kelly hired hotshot New York attorney Thomas Puccio to defend Alex. Puccio had successfully defended society figure Klaus von Bülow when he was accused of the attempted murder of his heiress wife, Sonny. Not guilty. <laughs> I got to know Tom Puccio at the Von Bulow trial. He never got the credit he deserved for getting Klaus acquitted. Puccio is a tough-as-nails prosecutor turned defense attorney. He fights hard for his clients, but he's not the kind who'll do anything to win. Whatever else you may think of them, the Kellys were smart to get Puccio on their side. The Kellys' support of their son extended beyond the hiring of a high-powered attorney. They never wavered in their defense of him, even when he had run. But all I could say is Alex was one brave kid to do what he did, right or wrong. The Kellys put up their home to cover Alex's million dollar bail. The term stated that he had to live with his parents, wear an electronic bracelet, and observe a strict curfew. In the eight years that had passed, Kelly had a stroke of legal luck. Connecticut law had changed. Now, his two rape cases had to be tried separately. The first trial would be for the rape of Adrian Back. Now married, Adrian Back Ortolano had spent nearly a decade waiting to testify against her attacker. As I got older, I got stronger, I got smarter, I got more confident. When he came back to the country, I said, well, I have to do this. He's a sick, violent, criminal rapist. While Kelly awaited trial, he fed the media frenzy by reuniting with high school girlfriend Amy Molitor. The two picked up their relationship where they had left off eight years earlier. She was at Kelly's side when his trial started on October 15th, 1996. I quite often would leave the pack of photographers and catch them coming out of Thomas Puccio's office where I would look at them and they'd be laughing and smiling like a couple of kids that were on their way to the prom. I don't think he believed he was going to go to jail. Adrian was the prosecution's first witness. With her identity hidden from the public, she told the jury how Kelly had choked her and forced her into the back of the car. She testified that during the rape, Kelly had never removed his hand from her neck. Kelly's attorney, Thomas Puccio, seized on this detail. He said it would have been impossible for his client to lower the back seat while simultaneously holding Adrian down with one hand. Puccio argued that Adrian had helped Kelly with the latch on the seat. Therefore, she had cooperated in having sex with him. Jurors take their uh, roles very, very seriously. They, 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 they don't convict people lightly. They really don't. Um, and if you give them something to work with, something like a physical impossibility of the latch on the door, uh, they can often get, get themselves very much involved in that aspect of it and not be swayed simply by the emotions or by the sympathy for the victim. But one juror was swayed by her emotions. Toward the end of the trial, she was making eye contact with Alex and exchanging smiles with him. Well, we certainly know that even though we like to all be feminist women on juries, like handsome men, whether it's the Menendez 
Smithses or the or Robert Chambers or William Kennedy Smith or OJ. The trial lasted seven weeks. When sent to deliberate, the jury deadlocked and the judge was forced to declare a mistrial. Many believe the main holdout was the juror who flirted with Kelly. His charisma got him off the hook. With a combination of a high-priced defense and his good looks and charm, Alex Kelly once again escaped prison. He was counting on the same formula in a second trial. But prosecutor Bruce Hudock was worried that a second trial would be too traumatic for Adrian. His tears were just pouring out of my eyes. And I just looked at him and I said, I'll be ready. Alex was still a free man, and it looked like he just might stay that way. <clears throat> Five months later, Kelly returned to the Stamford, Connecticut courthouse for the retrial. Defense lawyers have a saying, retrying a case after a hung jury is like putting on a wet bathing suit. While Alex appeared as confident as ever, the second trial would be much harder. Retrying a case after a hung jury, it's never good for the defense. The state now knows everything you're gonna do. The state had another powerful asset. Adrian was angry. The hung jury the first time around in her trial made her a much more formidable witness. She had finally, you know, reached that point where she just, th this was out of control, and she was mad, and she wanted him to go to jail. The retrial began on April 10th, 1997. In the first trial, the jury deadlocked over Adrian's testimony that Alex Kelly had never removed his hand from her neck while raping her. But in the second trial, Adrian said Alex had taken his hand off her neck for a moment to lower the seat of the car. Adrian's statement to the police from the morning after the rape confirmed her new testimony. But defense attorney Thomas Puccio continued to try to shake her. He would trick her with little things. Aha, Mrs. Ortolano, is it true that you were, you were communications made or are you acting now and you were biggest flirt? And it was like, who cares? It was like, you know, she was almost rolling her eyes at him. When somebody is angry and is telling the truth, all the BS that's coming from the other side, all the tactics, all the spin, all the strategy that a defense lawyer will use and, and a really good one will use, it just falls flat. The defense rested. Kelly's future was now in the hands of the jury. Just eight hours later, they returned with a verdict. The court was not yet in session but everyone was seated and it was pretty quiet and he was pacing back and forth. He was nervous. You could see it. This time, the jury found Alex Kelly guilty of rape. Alex immediately jumped up and said, I want to talk, I want to say something, I'm innocent, I didn't do this. And he looked over, I, I thought he was looking right at Adrian when he said, why are you doing this to me? Every other time that Alex Kelly went into a courtroom, somehow he got off on something. And this was the first time, you know, he's going to sentencing, which means he, he might get something, you know, instead of people taking it away all the time. Kelly was sentenced to 20 years in prison with a minimum requirement of 16 to be served. For the first time in his life, he couldn't charm his way out of it. He pleaded no contest to the second rape charge involving Hillary Tollett, receiving an additional 10 years. And I figured that a no contest was as close to an I'm guilty that I was going to ever get out of Alex Kelly. He'd never admit that he did anything wrong. And, and with my sentence on top of Adrian's, at least he was going to stay in jail. Alex Kelly is now serving his sentence at a maximum security prison in Connecticut. The star athlete turned fugitive, finally met defeat. Kelly's parents still live in the same house in Darien, and they continue to believe in their son's innocence. I don't imagine that any mother would expect her child 
to sit in a cell for 15 years for something that is untrue. I think on some level, and I know they'll never admit this, in their hearts, they know. They know exactly who he is. And I'm sure they've probably seen the person that Adrian saw and the person that Hillary saw. And I think they've seen that, and they choose not to acknowledge it. Joe and Melanie Kelly were never prosecuted for helping their son evade the law. Prosecutors believed that they would appear sympathetic to a jury, and the case against them would be too difficult to prove. I understand that you do whatever you can for your children, but I think that there's a, there is a limit. As a parent, you have to, you know, believe a little bit in the system, especially if you're white and rich and from Darien. I mean, you got more going for you there than most people do going in a rape trial. The Alex Kelly case is rarely mentioned in Darien. For the people who live here, Turning a blind eye not only helped to create Alex Kelly, it helps them to forget him. You know, it just, it couldn't happen here. Well, you know what, it did happen here. All of his life, everyone cut Alex Kelly a break. I think that where Alex is now, in state prison, his good looks and wholesome smile might not serve him too well. Alex Kelly started life with power and privilege and squandered it all. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. A handsome teenager with the whole world at his feet. The all-American boy. Great smile, good-looking kid. Accused of an awful crime. And he had said, you know, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Protected by parents who thought their son could do no wrong. Alex was one brave kid to do what he did. He ran from justice and hid out in style. It's a big world out there. There's lots of places to go. Can a wealthy family keep their fugitive son out of the grasp of the law? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. On the wrestling mat, Alex Kelly was king. At 18 years old, he was strong, fierce, and unbeatable. With a record of 11 and 0, Kelly was heading toward a county championship. The teenager had it all, looks, charisma, wealth, and popularity. It seemed like he could get away with anything. On the morning of February 14, 1986, two Darien police officers stopped Kelly on his way to his most important wrestling meet and arrested him for rape. Kelly wasn't concerned. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. But the star wrestler was worried about one thing. The only question he had for them was, am I going to get out of here in time to go to my wrestling match? Alex Kelly had been raised to think he could get whatever he wanted, whether it was a victory on a wrestling mat or a girl's embrace. It would take eight years and an international manhunt before he learned that there are limits 
even to privilege. The police and Darianne were getting familiar with Kelly. Two days earlier, he had been accused, though not charged, with another rape. I think he went through, you know, the majority of his, at least his adolescence as a person who never really had to, you know, be called to task for anything that he did. Darien police began to realize that Kelly had the potential for violence. The star high school athlete had been raping girls and getting away with it for years. The case set off an eight-year manhunt and a scandal that rocked one of America's wealthiest communities. It also raised a disturbing question. How could a golden boy become a serial rapist? And how could a whole town not have noticed? Darien, Connecticut is one of America's wealthiest suburbs. It's a picturesque, genteel place with private streets and million-dollar homes. Children here grow up sailing on Long Island Sound and driving BMWs. It was not unusual there at 16th birthday to see a bright, shiny new car in the parking lot, usually parked across two parking spaces. <laughs> so that the, the student parking lot had automobiles that far outshone those of the faculty. There was a great emphasis on surface serenity, surface order, and I think uh, that, that sort of uh, gave the town a history of learning how to conceal things. In the 1980s, Darien appeared serene, but when the town's parents went on